Program support provided by the F. Price Cosman Memorial Trust, Entrust Bank Trustee, bringing you the Kansas Wild Edge segments on Positively Kansas. It's time for Positively Kansas. Coming up, Kansans spread out across the countryside in search of an often elusive wild treasure. You have to know where to look, but the rewards can be delicious. Meanwhile, tasty treats are always a sure bet at this old-fashioned drive-in at Augusta. Discover how its timeless appeal keeps alive a cherished period in American history. Also, see how the history of a tiny Kingman County town is kept alive in its tiny museum with an even tinier town inside. Plus, art is popping up everywhere in this central Kansas town. Learn about the movement to turn downtown into a masterpiece of colorful murals. And in our Kansas Wild Edge segment, discover the mystery of the monarch and its epic 3,000 mile journey. Every year, there are welcome visitors to Kansas. We're glad you're here. I'm Sierra Scott. Those stories and more on the way. A half hour of information and inspiration starts right now on Positively Kansas. They're unknown to some and a mystery to many, but every spring, Kansans head for the woods on a hunt that often brings great frustration. However, it can also bring great rewards too. Jim Grayway has the story from Morris County. The hunt is on for one of Mother Nature's most mysterious creatures. You may not realize it, but the mushroom is more animal than plant, and the morel is among the most elusive and delicious. 40 years ago, when I, when we were in college up here in Emporia State, we went over to Redmond Dam. I found two grocery sacks full of them. Haven't found any since. The hope of finding some brought out a large crowd to Council Grove Lake. What about this appeals to you? Oh, it's just the, the taste of the mushrooms and the joy of getting out in the woods and hunting for them. This was a chance for budding mushroomers to be guided by the master. Tom Wipert is also known as the Mushroom King. There's no reason with what I see there is, it shouldn't be a morel somewhere. The window of time is short. Morel season typically lasts only about three weeks each spring. And it is something a lot of Cantons don't know much about, including Ken Meyer of Wichita. Well, I like mushrooms that you buy at the store, you know, and. Mm -hmm. put them on your steak or whatever, but I've never really ate morels. Mushroom hunting is certainly a bigger deal in some areas than it is in others, but the truth is morels exist all across Kansas. They're literally popping up all around us. It's really just a matter of heading out into the woods and knowing where to look. And when I see blooms on the trees, I see plenty of green. The main trees that you find them this early on, especially, would be a cottonwood that's blown down, like we find them on the root balls. For some reason, blowdowns go earlier than other trees or snap off. So if you see a cottonwood that might be snapped off or blown down, fresh blown down, that's going to be our best chance. Wipert makes a living hunting morels across the middle and western U.S. Because they emerge for such a short time and because scientists have never figured out how to cultivate them in large numbers, they command a high price on the retail market. Morels are symbiotic. They live with trees. So they do a life cycle with a tree. They attach to the tree's roots and they give it nutrients like copper, magnesium, and phosphorus in exchange for sugar. So when that tree gets dead or damaged, that's what triggers the morel to say, hmm, I need to reproduce. I need to kick a mushroom up, spread my spore out, grow my roots out, bring in more nutrients or find a new home. As far as those tree's roots grow out, which I'm saying, there could be morels this far out into the grass. But as hard as everybody looked, it turned out this hunt was just a little too early. I mean, today I didn't find any mushrooms, but I picked up some trash. Then a few days later, morels started popping up in Kansas. Here are just a few photos from across the state. And it turns out finding them is only part of the fun. The real payoff comes when you slice and fry them up. Eight to ten minutes in the skillet, you can see they're golden brown and they're done and ready to eat. So we're gonna 
Mmm, mmm, they're hot, but they're so good. One of the many other ways to eat them is in your scrambled eggs. Morels are a delicacy prized by the best gourmet chefs in France and also by any average Joe or Jane six-pack from Kansas if they know what to do and are up for the hunt. Near Council Grove, I'm Jim Grayway for Positively Kansas. In order to sell morel mushrooms in Kansas, you must be certified by the State Department of Agriculture. That's to make sure you know for sure you're selling morels and not something else that could be poisonous. Well, speaking of good eats, it's hard to beat an old fashioned hamburger fries and shake. This classic American cuisine was made popular in part because of an old fashioned drive in. There aren't many of them around anymore, but there's one left in Augusta. We sent Anna Spencer over there to find out what keeps this relic of the past still serving up treats after more than half a century. Built in the fabulous 50s, this iconic local eatery hasn't changed much. And if the oversized retro ice cream cone doesn't catch your eye, just wait till you see what they're cooking up inside. Miller's Five is an Augusta treasure, serving up carry-out style burgers and fries with onions, grilled buns, and the fixins. This historic drive-in was all the buzz 50 years ago and remains a favorite today. Owned for decades by the Miller family, Curtis and Lisa Mirage now maintain this local piece of history. And that was my husband's doing. He, we, we came here, we came here all the time, literally all the time. And then we found out they closed. And he's like, well, this would be a good opportunity to carry on the Miller's name. So. Oh, we just bought it. <laughs> Lisa learned the ins and outs of the business from members of the Miller family themselves, keeping their recipes and love for the community a priority. And while the place may be small, it delivers big time tasty treats, all made to order when you step up to the window. Everything is the same, however, everybody thinks we're fast food, but we're really not, because as you see, it's made when you order it. There's nothing pre-cooked or anything here, so. The parking lot fills in at the end of State Street and the lunch crowd lines up. With classic fare on the menu like limeade, shakes, onion rings and more, the blinking neon light says it all. Miller's Five is open and still going strong. Yeah, it's, it's really awesome because if, you know, being that we could, it's a nostalgic thing and being the fact that we could carry on this really old building and that all these people come back and say, just like I remember. Whether you're craving the classics, looking for a little bit of nostalgia, or ready to try a new favorite with a retro twist, they have it at Miller's Five. In downtown Augusta, I'm Anna Spencer for Positively Kansas. Miller's Five Drive-In serves up classic cheeseburgers, limeades, and twist cones every Tuesday through Saturday. It's right there on the south edge of downtown Augusta. One of the great things about traveling throughout Kansas is experiencing the hundreds of quaint historical small towns that dot the landscape. Anthony Powell recently visited the tiny town of Zenda, located in Kingman County, where residents have a particular pride about preserving history, and you'll be amazed at how they've done it. Main Street Zenda looks much like Main Street in any other small Kansas town. But do a little research and you'll find there are things about Zenda that make it very unique, especially when you consider less than a hundred people call it home. Let's begin with the name. Zenda was originally called Rochester after Rochester, Minnesota. But that got confusing because many other towns across America were also using the name Rochester. As the story goes, the wife of a Santa Fe railroad captain had read the novel The Prisoner of Zenda and loved the name. This somehow got back to town officials and they changed the name in 1892. Back then, Zenda was a thriving place, something that is remarkably captured behind the walls of this very ordinary looking building. I guess these were the dollhouses that I never had when I was a child. Lifelong Zenda resident Bonnie Bailey is referring to this astounding miniature Main Street Museum that she and some other residents created back in the 1980s to commemorate Zenda's centennial. 
There are 36 miniatures in all, showcasing the businesses that existed over a hundred years ago. Some are still around, like Blazy's service station. Back inside the museum, Bonnie told us she always felt very strongly about preserving her beloved town's history. You know, when you have one of those aha moments, uh, I realized that I could do it in miniature. But what could she use to create the miniatures? Ah, yes, pictures. I remembered some pictures that I had seen when I was a child. And um, I called the gentleman and asked him if he still had them. He said, yes, I do. I said, could I borrow them? He said, what? Sure you can. But he said, what are you going to do with them? And I told him. He said, you'll have those pictures immediately. But these weren't just any pictures. This was a goldmine collection of Zenda businesses from the late 1800s and early 1900s. Bonnie gave them to a woodworker friend of hers, who in turn supplied the plywood walls and roofs for the miniatures. Bonnie and some friends then constructed and painted the buildings in extraordinary detail, a process that took over two years. All these years later, she still gets a bit choked up when talking about the fabulous creation. Pride. Uh, I, I can see why. Just really incredible. It's even emotional for you. Yeah. Next, we move next door to the historical museum housed in the old bank building. Museum director Betty Green showed us all the fascinating items stored here, including memorabilia from the high school, which was shut down in the late 1980s. The uh, former students really enjoy seeing their old trophies. Betty is also overwhelmed with pride every time she sets foot in here. It's just such a close community and everyone, everyone beside myself is very proud of, of the community and, and Zenda and all the memorabilia that we've saved. You'll also find a lot of history here at the town's well-known restaurant, the Lumberyard Steakhouse, which at one time was an actual lumberyard. Folks come from miles around, some as far as Wichita, others from Alva, Oklahoma, to enjoy the home-cooked food. What an atmosphere. As you eat, there's a treasure trove of history to take in, including these beautiful floors restored from the original lumber yard. So from its well-known eatery to its fascinating miniature and historical museums, Zenda is a remarkable little town, preserving its history despite a population that has dwindled considerably over the years. A population small in number, but massive in pride. You know everyone and everyone knows your name, pretty much, and you feel safer, I think. It's just an awesome place to live. I can't imagine living any place else. A place that is indeed Positively Kansas. For Positively Kansas, I'm Anthony Powell. Tours of both the Main Street Miniature Display and the Historical Museum are available by appointment only. The phone number is easy to find if you just Google Zenda Community Museum. Now to Newton, where art is popping up all over. Large, colorful murals are proving to be a great way to enhance downtown Newton. Now a new project by a team of local artists is underway to keep it going. They recently unveiled a brand new piece of art that covers the entire back of a building. Here's what it's all about. This mural is uh, an idea that came from uh, a sunflower that Virgil Penner drew. But he had only offered a black and white outline of it, kind of like a coloring book. So I gave it to my art club kids and said, uh, if you could paint this sunflower, how would you paint it? Well, I've been the, the one fortunate enough to just say, yes, paint the back of my wall. Uh, my dad and I bought the building about 10 years ago. and. A few years ago, we had to redo the back of the wall, and uh, then we were approached by a group that um, my father's also been involved with, uh, sponsoring murals, saying, hey, we want to paint something. Like, yes. <laughs> to inspire some 
artists and bring the community together. They feel really happy that we're bringing color into our town, um, bringing old buildings to back to life. They want, I mean, there's a, a farmer's market that is held there. They're looking at doing that wall as a possibility. So I think it has, um, I just think it's a nice accent and I think it's a good beginning for what they're looking for. When we think about community, we often think about the geographic location for our community foundation. But this is the community of artists and art appreciators. And I think it's so exciting to have this launching in our community and the, the work that we can all do together. I think it shows that we are able to work together and that we enjoy working together and getting out. We've had a lot of compliments on how cheerful this mural is and how beautiful it is. The latest mural is on the building at 6th and Main in Newton. The local Rotary Club donated the paint for the mural and the work was all done by volunteers. Now the group is already planning its next mural for downtown. Now to this week's Kansas Wild Edge report on a story about one of the most recognized of all wildlife species, the monarch butterfly. As Mike Blair shows us, these orange flyers are known for their long migrations, very rare in the insect world. Butterflies are among the gentlest and most loved wildlife, and among them, monarchs are perhaps best recognized. Striking coloration and relative abundance make them popular sightings in flower gardens and city parks. Even most children know them by name. But these orange flyers are unique for amazing annual migrations that carry them over thousands of miles to a hideaway winter home in Mexico. And late September finds them silently passing, sometimes in great numbers, sometimes alone, as they heed a primal calling to ensure the next generation in the coming spring. Most monarchs live only about a month as adults. Starting as eggs laid on milkweed, they pass through a series of larval growth spurts that finally lead to a beautiful green chrysalis. Then they hatch into adult flyers that feed, mate, and lay more eggs as they move steadily northward. They die to be replaced by their young. During summer, four generations hatch and repeat, finally reaching southern Canada in the last generation. These last monarchs emerge in late summer, but they're different from their parents. Instead of mating and soon dying, these live for six to eight months with a built-in instinct to fly south for up to 3,000 miles to their winter home. Then in early spring, they head north and produce the first generation to start things over again. Southbound monarchs call little attention, but they're fascinating to watch. Flight speed is slow, normally less than 12 miles per hour and close to the ground with stops to feed on flowers along the way. The favorable north winds can aid their efforts and on such breezes, the monarchs may fly high and fast. The longest known flight of a tagged monarch in one day is 265 miles. They don't fly at night, and late afternoon or in rainy weather, they sometimes settle in large temporary roosts, attracted by scent pheromones released by resting monarchs. This can result in spectacular views when the orange butterflies assemble in numbers before separating and resuming their trips next morning. The monarch migration occurs in Kansas throughout late September and early October. Watch for it. 
you'll see the butterflies floating along, one here, one there, and all headed south. And you'll observe firsthand one of nature's most unexpected marathons by these small and fragile flyers. I'm Mike Blair for Positively Kansas. I'm really excited today because I have a former engineer who's also a poet. That is a rare combination as far as I'm concerned. Roy Beckemeyer, we're so excited to have you on the show. I'm really glad to be here. Oh my Thanks gosh. Thanks for inviting me. You have written a number of books. I love this. And this one especially, awarded. Tell me the award that this one oh, received. That one won the Kansas Notable Book Award in 2015. That's It's recognition that's given by the Kansas State Library for uh, books that they felt were exceptional in any given year. Well, congratulations. Thank that's you. A, that's a Thank huge you. I honor. Was, I was really happy about that. And you've come out with a new book. I have. Um, and you write poetry, which is, is kind of a rare thing, honestly. I mean, I think, well, let's say a rare thing to be published. Yes, um, right. So talk about why you got interested in poetry. Well, uh, I, when I first heard poetry in school, uh, I heard things like Poe and Coleridge, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and something about the way the, the rhymes happened and the language uh, was, was so rich and evocative, and the rhythms that were used uh, just kind of caught, caught me. And uh, so I started reading a lot of poetry. And when I got in high school, I started writing poetry, uh, love poems to my high school sweetheart. Lucky lady. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it worked because uh, we've been married now almost 60 years, so. Congratulations. And I still write her love poems, so. Oh, wow, yeah. she really is a lucky yeah, woman. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the things that you said off camera before you, we started this interview, and I think this is fascinating, is you think there's a connection between being in a math type brain and also poetry. Explain yeah, how that yeah, I do. connection. Uh, a lot <laughs> of people think you're left or right, right brain, but right. I, I, I happen to think there's a lot of similarity. Um, engineers have to pay attention to detail. A little tiny part might uh, be very important to the, to the airplane flying properly. And they also have to understand how all those parts fit together to make an airplane fly. Uh, in poetry, you pay attention to the word choice you're making very carefully, and you put those words together to describe some detail of what you're seeing, and hopefully to imply something about the way you see the world that wouldn't be obvious if you hadn't made those word choices. So uh, in both cases, you have to be able to focus on detail and see a bigger picture at the same time. I love that. Can oh. you, do you mind reading oh, I w I a would couple love of examples? To, to I would love to listen. A poem. Uh, this uh, was inspired by a, a walk outside in the morning, on a foggy morning. It's called Dew Point. Porch lights squint star patterns into morning mist. Windows curtained with condensate blink on with shy grace. Trees take on the magic of flotation. Down the street, joggers weave spirit manifestations. Their ponytails flicker in the foggy dawn. That's beautiful. Thank you. I love the way your mind works. Those words are just, and, and we were talking about this as well, it's almost a painting. Yeah. You're, you're similar to an artist in that way. Right. I love that. Thank you. And another one you want to share? Another one, yeah. Yeah, I'd um, love to hear another one. They're fantastic. I, I love the Kansas countryside, and so I a lot too. of my uh, poems deal with Kansas and the way it looks in different seasons. And this is called Cowley County October. Virginia creeper spatters the hackberries along Grouse Creek with splashes the same rusty color as the old man of a pump jack up on the crest of the hill. The cloisonne face of a cock pheasant slips between bronze shafts of blue stem. A plume of dust chases a pickup but can't follow it over the bridge. The smell of parched leaves drifts through the golden tracery of cottonwood trees. At the pool below the run, abstract impressionist carp 
swirl temporary images of distant spiral galaxies onto the surface of the creek. That's beautiful. I love Thank it. You. The way you paint a picture for me with words is absolutely and, gorgeous. And that's the maxim for poets, uh, show, don't tell. Yeah, and you yeah. really did. Um, if we want to find your latest book or maybe one of these, where, where's the best way to do that? Uh, they're all at Watermark Books and Eighth Day Books here in Wichita. They're also available on Amazon. Excellent. Roy, thank you for spending time with thank us. I really enjoyed me. it. The tick tock of the clock says it's time for us to hit the road. But before we do, jot down our email address, positivelykansas at kpts.org. We're always looking for story ideas. Thanks, I'm Sierra Scott. We'll see you next time for another half hour of information and inspiration on Positively Kansas. Program support provided by the F. Price Cosman Memorial Trust, Entrust Bank Trustee, bringing you the Kansas Wild Edge segments on Positively Kansas.